Good evening. It's good to see you all here tonight for our Wednesday night Bible study. And for those of you who are online with us on Facebook Live, thank you for being uh, in our uh, in with us, joining us. Uh, we also have a women's Bible study class that's uh, starting tonight. Uh, Michelle Roberts across the hallway there. And uh, if any of you ladies are interested in that, but we will continue to do our Wednesday night studies in here and uh, hope that you will continue to be faithful. Uh, it seems like we have, we're having roller coaster type weather. Uh, one day it's nice and then the next day it's uh, a little cold, but uh, we're used to that here in Oklahoma. We have, have seen all four seasons in one day, I think, so anyway. Let me make you aware of a couple of announcements uh, in regards to some of the church uh, things that are going on. This coming Sunday, we're doing a, a children's uh, emphasis. Our children are going to be uh, doing different things within the service. Brother Daniel and the children's ministry are uh, coordinating that. So you're going to see uh, them take uh, responsibility for different aspects of the service and uh, Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll see that happen this coming Sunday. And then as soon as the service is over, we will have a church potluck dinner uh, over in the uh, Fellowship Hall NPR and encourage you to come and be a part of that. The main uh, meat Sunday is the gospel bird, chicken. And so anyway, uh, we are... Um, going to be having that and uh, I was looking to see did, did brother Matt leave is he back over there well anyway uh, you need to come this coming Sunday because we're going to do some special things and I won't tell you anymore because I'll get in trouble but uh, we'll have the uh, potluck then we'll have business meeting and uh, it's our quarterly business meeting and we do have um, one particular situation that's going on is uh, we're going to be having, uh, showing or presenting a possible remodeling uh, plan for our auditorium and uh, up on the stage area, and uh, we're going to be sharing that with the church this coming Sunday. Uh, so anyway, please uh, be a part of that. Uh, bring a side dish or two and... Uh, share together with us and uh, if you I mean need any help green beans without onions would be good um, why people start putting onions with green beans I just don't know folks that's just it's one of the dilemmas that I have in life yes sir yes you can do that so anyway uh, Yes, banana pudding minus onions would be good too. Yeah. Brownies with nuts. With nuts. Brownies with nuts. Well, if you want to be a nut, go ahead and put nuts in them. <laughs> so that's the way I look at that. Well, good. I'm glad you resemble it. Anyway, we're going to have a good time together as a church family. On the 13th of February, which will be um, two Sundays from this coming Sunday, Two weeks from this coming Sunday. Uh, we will have uh, in the evening called Super Sunday. And this is going to be a fellowship time in the evening. We will uh, break from our discipleship first classes. I uh, encourage you to come and fellowship together. We're going to bring all kinds of snacks and things. And uh, so we want to encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, we'll let you know more about that as we get closer to it. But that is on Sunday, February the 13th. We are doing discipleship first uh, we started this past Sunday and got going pretty good. I think we had, when it was all said and done, a little over 100 uh, people in all the different classes. And uh, so it was good. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that as well. So those are some of the things that are uh, happening here uh, in the next uh, week or so as far as our church. So I ask you to be faithful, I ask you to continue to uh, pray and seek God's will uh, for your life and for our church as well. Uh, you should have a prayer list tonight, we won't go through that till the, the end of it, but 
Just to let you know, uh, Cindy Harju, uh, she lost her dad early this morning, um, Waco Hutchinson. And uh, so we need to remember her. She was there with him at Miami Hospital when he passed. And uh, anyway, we were made aware uh, of that situation. Uh, he had COVID pneumonia and, and some other things. He had some other health issues. But uh, anyway, just remember uh, that situation, if you would, tonight. And uh, pray for uh, Cindy and her family. Let's pray for our country tonight. As you know, there are... Um, some situations developing uh, uh, between Russia and U the Ukraine, and um, some of those situations can obviously affect us as Americans. And uh, so let's pray that, uh, that the Lord will intervene uh, in those situations. We know that some things are going to happen, and uh, sometimes we can't control those situations. But just pray and uh, I know that uh, through our prayers and through our diligence that we can, uh, I believe, get a better sense of what the Lord is doing in these last days, and we truly are living in these last days. So I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to begin our Bible study tonight. And uh, for those of you who have not been with us, we are dealing uh, with uh, getting through some difficult stuff. We've talked... Uh, for two weeks on temptation, and we're going to talk about misunderstanding tonight. Uh, misunderstanding. I'm sure none of you have ever been misunderstood. So uh, you may not even need this Bible lesson, but we're going to share it with you anyway. So let's bow for a word of prayer and ask the Lord to be with us. Father, would you uh, use your word tonight to encourage us, challenge us, I pray that you'd also use your word to convict us and to put us on the straight and narrow. Father, we live in a world today that constantly rejects the truth of who you are and what you have given to us. Uh, seems like people are looking for truth in all, all other ways and places, but not in your word. I pray that we as believers would, uh, would shine the light and the glory of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that we would take responsibility for being followers of you and the, the constant uh, responsibility that is there. Lord, we're, we're not perfect but, Lord, we do have the Spirit of God living in us if we truly are a believer. So, Father, I pray that you would uh, use this Bible study tonight to challenge us and encourage us. And maybe, Lord, you're going to use this uh, situation, this topic tonight uh, to challenge uh, not only our hearts, but maybe someone who is here tonight, Lord, you're going to speak to their heart and uh, get very personal with them about a, a matter that they may be dealing with in their, in their heart or maybe in their family or in their relationships. So, Father, we pray that you would use this time. I thank you for the faithful who have chosen to be here tonight. Lord, while we're meeting, we have uh, Michelle is teaching a women's Bible study tonight. We also uh, have our youth meeting. We also have our team kid program and then we have nursery age kids. We have adults who are throughout the building helping us. Lord, we have security uh, people who are helping us, safety team. And we just thank you, Father, for each and every person who is a part of this tonight. Thank you for the ministry that we have on Wednesday nights. Lord, be with those who are viewing online tonight. I pray that you would uh, meet needs there and that, Father, you would encourage them. And Lord, we long for the day when we can come back together as a church family and, and that we don't uh, necessarily need the uh, Facebook Live, uh, except for obviously those who are shut in and not able to get out. Uh, thank you, Father, that we can uh, send the message out. There may be someone tonight who just decides to get on and see what's going on in Grove, Oklahoma. I pray, Father, that you would touch 
and speak to their hearts as well. Lord, uh, use this time. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Tonight we're going to begin in our Bible. We're going to look in the Old Testament. We're going to look in the New Testament. Go to Genesis chapter 39, if you would, tonight. Genesis, the 39th chapter. Um, there are all kinds of misunderstandings that happen in life. If you have been alive very long, you have probably been misunderstood. Ralph Waldo Emerson has said, to be great is to be misunderstood. I didn't realize how great I was. <laughs> now I am reminded... <laughs> Please take that with a grain of salt. I did not mean that literally. Uh, I am reminded of the humorous story of an 80-year-old man, Mr. Smith, who went to see his cardiologist one day. Once the consultation was over, Mr. Smith on his way, like most people do. Two days later, the cardiologist was driving through the neighborhood there in the community, and he saw the same Mr. Smith who had been in his office two days before. And he was jogging, he was in a windsuit, he was jogging, and he had this beautiful young blonde jogging with him. He immediately pulled the car over, got out of his car, and waved Mr. Smith down. He said, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, oh, hey, Doc, how you doing? He said, the Doc said, what in the world are you doing? He said, I'm just doing what you told me to the other day in the doctor's office. He said, well, what exactly do you think I told you? He said, well, you told me to be cheerful and get a hot mama. <laughs> no, I did not, the doctor said. You obviously misunderstood. I told you to be careful. You have a heart murmur. <laughs> now, my wife's going to get mad at me for that when it's all said and done, but anyway... <laughs> I use that as an illustration that, folks, sometimes we can misunderstand what people are saying, especially if we're hard of hearing. Government. Yeah, so sometimes we misunderstand the situation, and it's not really quite what we thought it was. Might have not even been really the truth. If you have been misunderstood in life, then you understand the situation that happens from time to time. To time. Folks, you can have the best intentions. You can have pure motives and be misunderstood to the point that you're the bad guy. You ever been the bad guy? <laughs> I have. It's not any fun. Now, in Genesis chapter 39, we have a situation where um, Joseph... <laughs> You talk about someone who was misunderstood. He was misunderstood by his brothers, sold into slavery. But God was with Joseph even in spite of that. And so I want us to look in chapter 39 for just a little bit and just look at the situation. Okay? Let me begin reading in verse, uh, chapter 39, verse 1. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought him, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Notice verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. So he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight, and became his personal servant, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he owned, he put him in charge. It came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in jo Joseph's charge and with him, there he did not concern himself with anything, anything except the food which he ate. He found somebody that he trusted. How important that is, especially when you have a business or something. Now, notice the last part of uh, verse 6. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. 
Modern day version, he's a hunk. Ladies, that's what I hear some people say. All right, look at verse 7. It came about that after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master, Behold, with me here my master does not concern himself with anything in his house, and he has put all that he owned in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Now, folks, this continued on. I'm not going to go ahead and read everything else there. But at some point, she continues, Mrs. Potiphar continues to pursue him. He is a young man, and folks, that is a temptation for sure. We just talked about temptation. And so finally, he uh, basically, as the Bible says to flee temptation, he fled one day, left his coat, got out of the house, and she then began to scream or basically accuse him of rape. And so Joseph was put into prison. He had been unjustly accused and was obviously misunderstood. Folks, all he was doing, now think about this. All he was doing was serving God. All he was doing was honoring Potiphar, Potiphar and what he was supposed to be doing. He did exactly, God was with him, and yet this situation developed. So he was certainly misunderstood, and the situation could have, I mean, stop and think about this. I mean, Joseph went on to be in prison, was left there, was forgotten, at least not by God, but he was forgotten by man. But eventually God worked the situation and Joseph became second in command in uh, Egypt behind Pharaoh. But he had to go through some misunderstanding to get to that point, okay? Now I don't know about you, but I, I might have been a little bit bitter about that. I might have been upset. God, why did you allow this to happen? All I tried to do was do what you told me to do. And folks, people, there are people all over the world that are in that situation today, like uh, Joseph. They may not be of the character of Joseph from the standpoint that he truly was trying to serve the Lord, but I have talked to people. Brother Jim, man, all I'm trying to do is to do the right thing and live the right way, and, and then this happens to me. I don't understand. So, Sometimes it's difficult to deal with misunderstandings, okay? Now, I want us to go to the uh, New Testament for a minute. We've seen Joseph here in uh, Genesis chapter 39. I want you to go to Mark chapter 3 for just a moment. And we're going we're gonna to hibernate in Mark 3 for the rest of the evening. But I just wanted to give you a... Uh, a situation here in uh, Mark, or a situation there in Genesis. Probably the most misunderstood person in the New Testament was Jesus himself. His name, Jesus, he, he's the God-man. You know, he's supposed to handle all this stuff, but folks, what I'm going to show you tonight in Mark chapter 3, maybe you will have not seen before or not thought of in this way. Let me read to you a little bit uh, from Charles Swindoll. He makes the comment that the most misunderstood individual in the New Testament was Jesus Christ. Critics joked about the circumstances of his birth. They disputed his divine origin with ethnic jeering and vicious taunts, even to the point of accusing him of belonging to Satan. They scorned his person. Uh, his purposes, they reviled his teachings, they were suspicious of his motives, critical of his methods, and angered by his message. Ultimately, the Jewish leaders conspired with the Roman officials to put him to death. This explains uh, what the Apostle John meant when he wrote, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. That's in John chapter 1 verse 5, and then he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. That's John 1, 11. 
Christ came in an uncomprehending darkness where he met nothing but unbending misunderstandings. Okay? So, here's Jesus as one of the most misunderstood individuals. And so here in Mark chapter 3, we're going to see some examples of that. And so I want us to look at this for a moment here tonight, okay? Uh, let's begin in verses 1 through 4 here. Now this is where Jesus heals on the Sabbath, okay? And that is a no-no in the religious, in the Jewish tradition, okay? You're not supposed to do that. Uh, there's only a few things you could do supposedly on the Sabbath. It was so sacred to them, and they had added to it, obviously. And so let's look at that. Beginning in verse 1 of Mark chapter 3, He entered again into the synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. They were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and come forward. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save, or the, or to, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. All right, so Jesus here is obviously misunderstood by the Pharisees from the beginning of this passage. Folks, the Pharisees are looking out for Jesus. In fact, there in verse 2, it says they were watching him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. I mean, these people weren't coming to listen to a message. They weren't coming to really see Jesus and decide whether they thought he was the Messiah or not. They were there with ulterior motives. They wanted to catch him. They wanted to trap him. They wanted to try to arrest him, get him out of the way, okay? And so they misunderstood his redemptive message here on the earth. And they were out to get him. And it's clear that the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders were gunning for Jesus. And he had just, folks, he had just begun his earthly ministry. I mean, stop and think about that. I can remember when I started uh, my ministry as God called me to preach. I needed some good things to happen to confirm what God was doing in my life. I, man, if, if somebody would have done this to me, I'm not sure if I could have handled that. So, uh, they're plotting to get him, and you talk about misunderstanding someone. Folks, Jesus wasn't there to, uh, to hurt anybody. He didn't have bad motives. He was simply trying to, to follow the Father's plan and to do the ministry that God had sent him to do as the Lamb of God. And he had pure motives. He didn't have imp impure motives. He did everything right. And yet, they are not happy with him. So there in verses 3 and 4, uh, Jesus turns it around on the religious leaders and asks them a question about the uh, man with the withered hand. Is it good to do evil or good on the Sabbath? <clears throat> also notice that Jesus said just before that, I believe it's in verse 27 of chapter 2, Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made, was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Okay? And sometimes we can take things too far when it comes to um, the laws and the rules that God gives us. The Pharisees were all about rules. Nothing about compassion, folks. It was all about rules. They wanted, they were stickler for the rules, okay? And so they would even go beyond the commandments of Scripture. What, is the, what, is the, what does the Ten Commandments tell us about the Sabbath? What's the quote? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, okay? That's pretty simple, isn't it? Okay? Six days God worked, he wanted one day for the Sabbath. Shabbat, as they call it over there in Israel. Uh, it, I tell you what, it was quite interesting to be in Israel. Lori and I got stuck on one of the Shabbat elevators. You say, 
are you being serious? I said, yeah, it was not the express elevator, that elevator, folks. This thing only went one floor at a time, and it was slow. It's the equivalent of the Sunday driver that gets in front of you going 15 miles an hour in a 40-mile-an-hour zone. We didn't realize what we had done till I mean, we, I mean, folks, I could have crawled up the stairs and got there quicker. Finally, somebody uh, told us, said, you're in the wrong elevator. And it just happened to be the Friday that we were there that that thing, it was really going slow. So anyway, they do have Shabbat elevators in Israel, so be careful if you ever go over there. But the religious leaders, they went beyond. It says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. They added, and don't even think about walking on the lawn of the temple because if you bend the blades of grass, that constitutes work and you're violating the Sabbath. Now come on, folks. Is that what God really wanted when he gave us remember the Sabbath to keep it holy? They were legalists with a capital L. Jesus restores a wounded uh, man with a withered hand, and the Pharisees go ballistic there in verse uh, 6. It says, the Pharisees went out immediately. They began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. I mean, come on, folks. That's what Jesus was dealing with. You talk about misunderstandings. So, now the modern day application, be careful today if you concentrate strictly on rules and rules alone. You might be a modern day Pharisee. Folks, the law doesn't save. The law shows how far we fail. It is by grace through faith in Christ that you and I are set free to be able to live the Christian life, okay? Now, not doing away with the Ten Commandments, not doing away with the law or anything like that. Jesus came to fulfill it. He didn't come to destroy it. He came to fulfill it. He's the only one that could handle the Ten Commandments. You and I can't, okay? So Jesus was misunderstood by the Pharisees basically in verses 1 through 4. Now, it goes on, and we deal with some other things here, but I want you to go down uh, to verse uh, 20, I believe it is. He cho chooses the 12, basically in verses uh, 13, and then here we go down to 20, okay? So Jesus is misunderstood by the Pharisees. The second thing, Jesus was misunderstood by his own people. Look at verses 20 and 21. And he came home. And the crowd gathered again to such, such an extent that they couldn't even eat a meal. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying he had lost his senses. <coughs> um, the verses here in Mark talk about Jesus coming back to his hometown, or at least the area in which Jesus was from. Uh, and notice what transpired transpires in these two verses hometown people can really be tough on their own can't they uh, we have a church member she's not here tonight uh, Joyce Irving but Joyce used to uh, teach brother Matt and I when we were young there at Emanuel Baptist Church in Sky Tuke and she's told me how many times she sat in one of these seats and marveled at the fact that God could call me to be a pastor because I was such an ornery little cuss well, all I can tell you is God has a sense of humor, okay? Now, these people that saw Jesus grow up, folks, they thought he had lost his senses. Here he is starting his ministry. All he's doing, folks, all he's trying to do is do the will of his Father. He's already been misunderstood by the religious leaders. Now he's been misunderstood by his own people. Um, when they use the term lost his senses, they're basically saying he was mentally insane. Folks, someone who is doing God's will could be construed by others as being 
mentally insane. Because they don't understand the fact that what a person gives up to follow Christ and how he uh, gives up the world and seeks to follow the Lord in obedience. I have a friend of mine who's in the ministry and he did something I wouldn't necessarily recommend but he felt God was calling him. He went back and pastored his home church in which he grew up in. And he was telling me about that experience one day. He said, Jim, some of them people remembered me as the little snot-nosed kid in the youth group and everything, and they could not get past that mental picture. They never were able to look at me as the pastor. I was still that kid in the youth group or that kid in the children's group, okay? And they just didn't, there were some that just never gave him a chance to be their pastor, okay? So his home, the hometown people of Jesus, they might have even had a problem with the disciples he picked. Folks, those were not on a who's who's list to succeed, necessarily. I mean, you got the sons of thunder. You got Peter and Andrew and people like that. You've got Judas Iscariot who's going to betray him. So the consensus was, was that they needed to rescue him from, his, from himself. Jesus was misunderstood by his own people. Well, let's continue on in the passage. Look at verse 22. This is right in the context of what's going on here. The very next verse it says that the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying he is possessed by Beelzebub and he cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. Uh, the Pharisees misunderstood Jesus' actions. His own people misunderstood, or the Pharisees misunderstood Jesus' actions. His own people misunderstood his passion and the scribes now misunderstand his power. I've been called some interesting names as a pastor over the years. But I don't remember ever being called Satan. But folks, that's exactly what the scribes called him. The word Beelzebub is another word for Satan. Uh, and listen, Jesus was fully divine but he was also fully human here he is trying to do God's will and they have equated his work all he's been doing is healing people restoring people teaching the truth of God's word and yet he's been misunderstood and now they're saying that Satan is using him but listen he <laughs> On this one, he didn't let that one go. So he responds, look at verse 24, or actually verse 23. And he called them to himself and began speaking them, to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be, given, be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemy, blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of the eternal sin because they were saying he had an unclean spirit. Okay, now... The subject of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that's another subject on another day. I, I would have to get off and chase some rabbits on that one, so we'll come back to that sometime. But think about this. You remember the old nursery rhyme, sticks and stones shall break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Lie, lie, lie. Folks, we have blasted people with our words. We've assassinated people with our words. We have destroyed people with our words. So we need to understand the accusations and the names had to hurt. 
for strangers to say it, that's one thing. But your own townspeople is another. All Jesus did was good, and he healed and was still misunderstood to the max. So, let's do the report card here. Misunderstood by the Pharisees, misunderstood by his own people, misunderstood by the scribes. Surely it can't get any worse. Well, look at verse 31. It does get a little worse. In verse 31, then his mother and his brothers arrived. Now, here's where he'll get his support, won't he? Then his, mothers and his, bro- his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Answering them, he said, Who are my, who is, who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about all of those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now, I think the biggest blow to anybody had to be when you're misunderstood by your own family. The fact that the family waits outside and calls him out is to imply that they didn't want to further shame him. They too thought he was not in his right mind. What a blow it was to the Lord with his own mother and family misunderstanding him. Now his, his mom is going to get back on track. She loved her son. But folks, he kept right on doing the ministry of his heavenly father that had commanded him to do. Jesus was misunderstood by all these people, but he endured. So can you. I don't know what you're going through tonight. Maybe you have been misunderstood by family members. Maybe you've been misunderstood by a church family member. Maybe you've been misunderstood by a business partner. Maybe you've been misunderstood by a friend. How do we handle misunderstandings tonight? Well, let's get a little practical. I think if you are misunderstood, you need to ask the question, who? Who is being misunderstood? And who is it that says they misunderstand you? Now, folks, There are people out there, I am convinced, as a pastor. Number one, there are people out there that are convinced that they are put on this earth to vote no on anything that ever happens. Okay? God put them on this earth. And there are going to be some people that are going to be negative. There are going to be some people that are going to to take what you do or say and they're going to twist it and they're going to misunderstand it. So basically, you need to consider the source. Some people make it their mission in life to make other people as miserable as they are. So realize who it is that says that they're misunderstood. Now I'm not saying I'm not saying that that's an easy situation. I'm simply saying to you tonight, ask the question, who is it that's misunderstood? Who is it that claims to be uh, in that situation? Now, if it's more than one person, you need to take stock in that. You need to look and see that maybe there's something in your personality or something that's going on that uh, may, may need some correction, okay? The second thing is if you are misunderstood, ask why. You may be misunderstood because of actions done inadvertently. Folks, I had that happen to me. I'm going to share this story with you. This is a true uh, personal story that that was very difficult for me to deal with for a while, but it it ended up being a good situation. When I went to Henrietta First Baptist Church, the secretary position at the church was split up with two ladies. Both of them had been there a while. And the way they had it was one particular lady, her name was um, uh, Joyce Hunter, and uh, she, uh, she worked on Monday and Tuesdays. And then another lady in the church, her husband was a deacon. In fact, both of the ladies were de- deacons' wives. Uh, Donna worked on Thursday and Friday, and then they alternated Wednesdays. So one of them would work three days one week, one of them would work three days the next week. So 
I didn't always have the same secretary in the, in the office for the week, so I had kind of had to remember who I had talked to, you know. Did I tell this particular one about a, you know, a prayer request that had been, uh, you know, brought in, or, or, you know, if it's something that I wanted the secretary to do, did I tell Donna, or did I tell that uh, to Joyce, or whatever? So anyway, by the way, it wasn't Joyce, her name was Laureen. I, uh, there's another, uh, there's a Joyce Hunter, it's, it's Laureen Hunter. And so anyway, Lorraine decided to retire. Well, Donna, uh, she had grandkids that she loved dearly. So she asked me one day, uh, Brother Jim, what would you want to see happen? And I said, well, you know, I don't know. Let me think about it. So she called one day from home before all this, had, before Lorraine had retired and everything. And so she said, uh, well, have you thought about any more about it? And I said, yeah, I really have thought about it. I said, Donna, what I'd really like to have is I'd like to have you all five days. And she didn't give me a chance to finish the statement. And what I was going to say, if I can't have you the five, I'll take you for how many ever you can. She got off the phone and she just started crying and told her husband that basically I'd fired her. <laughs> Folks, I had done no such thing. But I got a call from an irate deacon and about five minutes later. And I answered the phone. He said, how dare you do that to my wife? She doesn't deserve that. I said, deserve what? I had no idea what had happened. Well, when he finally conveyed to me what had happened, I knew I immediately needed to go to their house. <laughs> I had to do some groveling. I, you know, I didn't get on my knees, but I was ready to. And I wanted Donna to know, Donna, you didn't let me finish. And so anyway, I told her what the situation was. And so uh, it, it all worked out. She ended up working three days a week. She wanted two days off to be able to take care of them grandchildren. And that's the way we worked it out. We found another lady in the church who was able to do those two days. And she did the first three days. And another lady did the last two days of the of the week and uh, everything was fine between me and her husband and we got through the situation but I'm going to tell you it was, it was tense there for a while but folks I was, I was misunderstood because I did not in any way shape or form want that lady to be fired I didn't want to get rid of her I wanted her for all five days but I was going to be willing to take whatever so anyway sometimes misunderstandings happen okay and listen, folks, um, sometimes we can do things unintentionally. I've been accused by people before of not uh, being, you know, maybe in a, on a Sunday morning. Uh, I had one particular man who was getting, he just had some beginning stages of dementia. He thought I was deliberately ignoring him in the church. And it absolutely was not true, but in his mind it was happening. And folks, when it happens in your mind and you're having some issues with your mind, it's real. His wife knew it wasn't real, but he didn't know it was not real. So I had to go through some things like that. So folks, sometimes inadvertently we can do things and maybe we have a blind spot to it. Maybe somebody needs to share with us and you know, sometimes you need to listen to some counsel and say, hey, you may not mean it that way, but this is the way it's coming across. Brother Jim, you know, you're coming, sometimes you come across, you, you're, you're a little bit uh, rough on people and what you say. You need to be careful with that, okay? So, if you are misunderstood, ask why. And if you constantly are misunderstood, check what's going on in your life. Okay? All right. Number three, when misunderstanding is resolved, ask the question, what? Why can I learn from this? Uh, how can I learn from my experience? Make sure you own up to your mistakes. Listen, folks, sometimes people are just rude. Okay? I've been acute, you know, listen, I've been rude before, and I'll probably be rude again. I, I don't intentionally try to do that but sometimes we are okay so own up to our mistakes and maybe the next time respond in a more mature way 
be the adult in the room. And folks, let me, uh, this just happened the other day. I was talking with my uh, brother, and he was telling me about one of our cousins who we have not seen in several years just because of distance and everything. And his, this uh, cousin of ours, his son, had passed away suddenly. And uh, he called and talked to my brother and he shared with me, he said, you know, me and my son, we had uh, become estranged. And uh, I always thought I had time to get things right, and then he dies. And folks, he was not doing well because of that. Don't let those kind of things go. Folks, life is too short for you to hold on to a grudge. Did you hear that? I'm, I'm saying that to myself too. And you may be right in, not, in, in 95 to 98, 99% of that situation. But listen, be careful. Now, let me, uh, let me close with some words from uh, Charles Swindoll about the idea of bitterness and forgiveness. He says, in, he says, we need to discuss two important words. Forgiveness and bitterness. Without the first, you'll limp through life with the second. Misunderstanding can breed deep-seated bitterness, which doesn't easily go away. And folks, the Bible says in Hebrews, it calls bitterness a root of bitterness that can dig in and gain control within your, within your emotions. Forgiveness must occur if you ever hope to be free of your painful past. It doesn't mean you agree. It doesn't necessarily mean you now have a close relationship with your offender. But it does mean you let it go forever. And yes, to forgive does mean to forget. Bitterness deposits dangerous germs in our memory banks. I love that. Not that I love having dangerous germs, but I think it's, it's very uh, well said. Bitterness deposits dangerous germs in our memory banks. It can cause disease that lingers and robs us of our joy and peace as the years stack up. So you must forgive and forget. Now listen to this next phrase. Bitterness replaces forgiveness or forgiveness erases bitterness. They cannot coexist. Let me say that one more time. Bitterness replaces forgiveness, or forgiveness erases bitterness. They cannot coexist. My friend Satan will tell you that you have every right to stand on the ground that you're in and not budge. But what did Jesus say? He said to forgive 70 times 7. None of us are even close to 490 times. And what Jesus was saying basically, forgive, period. Okay? Folks, life's too short to live that way. Okay? I need to say it to myself and I say it to you tonight. You're going to be misunderstood, but don't allow the enemy to use misunderstanding to get you off track from following Christ, okay? Too many people have grown on, I mean, I, listen, I, as a pastor, I deal with this, especially when there are funerals. You would be surprised, folks. People refuse to forgive. Here's these family situations, and then boom, something happens, and folks, it just it, it's just tough. And it can happen with good friends. It can happen with neighbors. It can happen with churches. What kind of witness are we as believers? portraying to the outside world if we can't get along with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ from other churches. 
How many churches have split over the color of carpet or because somebody got their feelings hurt? And folks, there are some churches, I'll say, and, and you know, I, we've got to look within ourselves as well, but there are churches within our associations, our own association, that can't get along with one another. And uh, I'm not sure we're going to be able to make the impact that God wants us to in this world if we're not willing to get through the misunderstandings in life, okay? So let's remember that. Um, All that was free, didn't cost you a thing, okay? And I know I meddled a little bit tonight. Preachers, sometimes they, uh, they get off on rabbits and then sometimes they meddle, so... You'll just have to, if if you've got a problem with me, you can see me afterwards, okay? All right, let's uh, look at our prayer list real quick, and then we'll close tonight. I already mentioned Cindy Harju to you, the Scots, Vernon, and Kathy. Vernon continues to kind of go, he's doing better, but he does have some moments where uh, sometimes his breathing is not as good as they want it. They're doing therapy with him, and he also uh, has some heart uh, issues that they're just kind of watching. So remember both Vernon and Kathy tonight. She's still on oxygen at home, but she is doing better. We've been asked by a Kimberly Walton to remember parents and family tra- traveling to uh, an uncle who is on hospice. Uh, the friend, they're friends of the Hopkins, the uh, Yost family, and the death of Mitch Yost. So let's remember that situation. <clears throat> let's remember our servicemen, folks. Uh, 8,500 servicemen were put on special alert with the possibility they may be headed overseas. So let's pray for all of our servicemen. Our college students are back. If you want to know about people who are misunderstood and they are right in the middle of some of this stuff that's going on in our world today, our college students need prayer. Uh, Some of the others that we've been praying for, Susan Bass with knee surgery, uh, let's remember the Boltons tonight, Alan Bruns, uh, Imogene Carr, Mark Clark, Rita Cunningham, the Double D's, Velma Geis, Jean Grounds, uh, June Heitzman is in rehab at Grandwood. Yes, Ray Henry is home from the hospital. Actually, his niece, she texted me yesterday, I believe it was. She's actually got her, him at her house. I'm not sure what that means yet. It may be that he's not doing Uh, very well at all because they didn't put him back in the rehab center so we'll try to find out that we spoke with tina and steve henry last night on the phone they've already started uh, treatments and things like that there in scottsdale arizona Uh, pray for them and remember them Um, some of the things that they are doing some of the treatments and things that they're doing is not covered by insurance and things like that Uh, We have uh, the deacons met this past Sunday. If any of you would like to uh, to give towards some of their expenses, just give through the benevolent fund and put Henry family, and uh, we'll make sure that they receive. Uh, They have to travel 25 minutes every day one way to get to this place in order for her to have treatments, and it's every day of the week, okay? Uh, let's continue to remember Janie Hopkins. She goes for a consultation on February 8th and will be having surgery at some, at some point. Uh, let's remember Billy Hausman. It's good to see Billy with us here tonight. And uh, Jeanette Maynard is still in Grove Nursing Center. Uh, Stephanie Plummer continues to have some health issues, but she is doing better from what I understand. She had a tooth that was removed that was causing some issues, uh, pain issues, so... Uh, we praise the Lord for that. Been praying for Charlene Pritchard, the Shilt family. I believe Chris uh, Thomas, can you confirm that he did make it back to Malawi? He's not listening to me. He's on his headphones back there. I think he's listening to music. Uh, anyway, uh, Chris was supposed to get back. Um, uh, yeah, he left Tuesday. Yeah, he was in Newark last night, but hoping to get, okay, all right. Well, anyway, these are some of the prayer requests tonight. Let's remember these. You may have some others. Um, Sometimes people have unspoken prayer requests. They don't want us to know particulars, but just to pray for situations. 
Uh, so let's remember that tonight as well. So appreciate your faithfulness tonight. And uh, now let me tell you what's going to happen next week before I close. Uh, Brother Daniel has a, a project that he has to do for his seminary doctorate. So he has to teach um, adults. And you all fit that age uh, bracket. So next Wednesday night, we're switching. He's going to teach you all, and I'm going to teach the youth for one session. So Brother Daniel will be in here, and he, uh, I'm not sure what it is that he's teaching you, but uh, it's going to be a project that he needs to fulfill for his doctorate. So uh, you all uh, just uh, be faithful as you have been with me. And you might want to pray for me as I go back with the youth. That might be the interesting situation. So. Uh, I'm going to try to be contemporary with them, but uh, I hadn't been a youth since 1974. So anyway, so remember those situations and pray for one another. All, you know, uh, use the, I encourage you, if you don't have the directory on your phone, uh, get that. That's an excellent uh, app, and it has m most of the pictures of all of us. Uh, and if you don't know how to do that, see Miss Terry in the office, and she can, you got to have a smartphone. You can't have a dumb phone, but you got to have a smartphone. <laughs> so. And and a semi-smart operator. But we'll show you how to get it, okay? Just the ministry. Ministry. Well, who else would it be? Well, We're an exclusive group. We only allow members. I know. Well, we'll get them in there. All right, let's stand. We'll be dismissed. Thank you all for being here. Remember, choir, you will meet with Brother Matt afterwards. Is he anywhere around? Does anybody know? He was here. He was here, but he left. All right. I hope he closes his ears. He's got this coming Sunday, the second week of January, which is five years here. We're going to recognize him Sunday in the meal before the uh, business meeting, okay? So uh, if you would like uh, to uh, give him a card, let him know how much you appreciate him, we're going to Maybe let some of you all speak for a little bit there and just share uh, how Matt has been a blessing to us for these five years. So that will be coming up this Sunday. We'll have a big cake for him, and uh, Darla's supposed to be with him, and he better not be listening. So anyway, huh? Oh, well, I just wanted to make sure some of these people don't go to Sunday school. All right. All right, well, anyway, that's what's happening Sunday, okay? All right, let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father... Lord, would you help us when we go through difficulties in life? Life's not fair. Not Situations don't always happen the way they would want them. Relationships can be messy. Father, family issues can even be more messier. I'm just asking you, Lord, tonight, would you uh, help us to be individuals that can help heal that which is broken? Would you help us, Lord, if nothing else, to pray diligently that you would be able to move in people's lives and that the bitterness will be replaced with forgiveness? Father, give us a perspective tonight on how, how short life really is here on this earth. And Lord, uh, you forgave. You were willing to uh, provide salvation forgiveness of sin. Help us to be like you. Lord, as we leave this place tonight and we go out into the world, remind us, Lord, that it is our responsibility to show the love of Christ and the light of Christ. Thank you, Lord. Leave with us here tonight with the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed.